Our reading this morning is from John's Gospel. It's the 15th chapter, beginning at the first verse. It's on page 1100 in your pew Bible. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I spoke to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is the word of the Lord. Life is full of rules that we have to follow, rules that we have to follow if we want our lives to amount to something, amount to anything. Rules like simple ones, we learn them as children. If you want to have friends, you have to be loving, you have to be trustworthy. If you want to become proficient at something, you have to apprentice yourself, you have to learn that trade from the ground up. You don't want to sleep on the couch for a year. Men, remember your wedding anniversary, right? Get it tattooed on your hand. Good rules, bad rules, they're kind of all around us. Some good rules lead places that are healthy and right. Of course, bad ones lead the other direction. Let me give you an example of a bad rule. Sam and I were in first grade together. Sam was a very serious boy, even at that age. I was kind of even less so. We became friends, we played at each other's houses. I had other friends at school. I'm not sure that Sam did. I'm not sure that he had other friends. One day, Sam made up a rule. I had to promise to play with him during every recess. This was not a rule we made together. Pretty soon, I wanted to play with other kids, not just Sam. So Sam made another rule. I could play with other kids, but then I'd owe him. I think I'm going to go play with Andrew today, Sam. Okay, but that means that you now owe me four times together on the playground. Pretty soon, I had a tab I couldn't pay. My debt was in <laughs> double digits. I became upset about this. I kind of kept it to myself, but Sam wouldn't budge. My mom, of course, moms, you know, something's wrong. So she said, what's going on? I explained what was happening. I've got good news, my mom said. You don't owe Sam anything. That's a really weird way to think about friendship. When you go to the playground tomorrow, tell him that. I can still remember the deep sense of relief. I felt that I could go and tell Sam, you know what, those rules are bunk. This is not how this friendship's going to work. I've been freed from a strange kind of, if you're truly my friend, then you will give me every recess. Right? <laughs> a strange rule. Sam changed dramatically, right? By the end of grade school, we were fast friends. Sam believed, though, at that time, if we were going to be friends, I had to do as he said. I had to follow the playground rules. How about an example of a good rule? You know, if you have a CPA, certified public accountant that you go to, you want them to follow the rules, right? And furthermore, you want them in their training to have gone through all the steps that get them to the point where they can say something is true, something's not true, you can trust them. Same thing goes for ordination process in the Presbyterian Church. It's intentionally tough. They stretch it out over three years before you can take your exams. It's made to last that long in part to test your commitment. Are you just kind of trying this out do you think being a pastor might be kind of interesting, even exciting? Were you really successful 
maybe in some other business, and you think, well, clearly what the church needs is just to take all of that and import it into the life of the church, right? No. During those three years, you learn what it is to be a pastor. You have to do something called clinical pastoral education. Every pastor in our tradition has to do up to 300 hours of ministry in hospital settings where you're simply going to pray with and be with someone who's suffering, who's dying, for whom life is not gonna change. They're not impressed by how bright you are, how smart or energetic, whatever. They're not living under any illusions and they don't have any time for yours. You learn how to pray and be present with people. At the end of those three years, you've gotta take exams. Right? There are four of them and then there's one that lasts five days. It's a lot of stuff. To top it all off, you can finish all of these requirements and until the Spirit calls you to serve at a church, you're not a pastor. It's a big, big process. It might not sound like a positive example, but I think it is, if we really look at it, what it means to be a pastor. It should be difficult. It should be difficult to do that. Remember the end of my three years, I felt like I'd really been through something that had tested me and shown me this is what it's like. This is why it's difficult. It's a challenging, but ultimately a good rule good and bad rules, really all over the place if you look for them. But the fact is that even our good rules, even the good ones that we follow, that we should follow, they can become oppressive. Listen to how one pastor describes this kind of if-then world that we often live in. Right? If you eat your broccoli, you can have some dessert. If you clean up your room, you'll get a star. Mom and dad will be happy. If you get good grades, you'll pass the class. If you pass the class, you'll graduate. If you work hard, you'll make some money. If you get some money, you can buy that car. If you have a nice car, she might finally go out with you. If you treat her nice, she might stick around. If she agrees to marry you, maybe the guys at work will look at you differently. And of course, if you get their respect, then you might get a promotion. There'll be more responsibilities. You better perform. If you don't company won't have a good quarter, and then there might be cutbacks. If you lose your job, you might not be able to provide for your family. Schools aren't cheap. There are no free lunches, and even broccoli is getting more expensive every day." End quote. We can get stuck, can't we, in this world of if-then rules, even good ones that make sense, that help us to progress through life. But that if-then world, if there's nothing underneath it to support us, there's nothing deeper and stronger underneath it. It becomes oppressive. There can be, it can be graceless. Grace can be missing in that world. Sort of one law after another. Just a side note, Paul's letter to the Galatians, it's really all about that. These rules that we can use to bind our own conscience, even God's own law, used to bind the conscience, but there's no foundation in God's grace in the gospel underneath it. Many of the rules that we create are about answering Dale Carnegie's question, the famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. We want to do that. The drive to do it is as old as humanity. Our desire to find love, acceptance, friends, influence, it's often what gets us into a really a heap of trouble. When we take our bad, even our good rules, and we apply them to our salvation, that's where it gets really bad really quick. The answer that helps us out of our trouble. We read it, you heard it in the passage that I read from John 15. Did you hear it kind of buried? There are a lot of verses in there. If you abide in me, then. There are a lot of if, then. There's one sentence in there that's the foundation. It's the gospel, and it was this. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you clean. It sounds strange to us for at least a couple of reasons. Does that mean we were dirty? What does it have to do with the sort of the pruning and the branches and the fruit? Better translation of that word cleaned or cleansed is a clean cut. Clean cut. It's as if Jesus said, I made, I came in and I made a clean cut, a clean break for you in your life. So now you have because that's true, the question never is, 
what must I do? What ladder must I climb, right, to be accepted by God? In fact, if I had to put the gospel, I had to put it into one sentence, it's not if, then. It's since you are accepted in Jesus Christ, fully loved and known, then what would you like to do? How would you like to serve him? When we take that grace-filled understanding of our relationship with God, it becomes the solid foundation that we can then go out to and participate in a healthy way in the other relationships in our life, in our friends, our family, our work. We don't ask any of that, friends, family, or work, to bear a weight that it can't sustain, to save us, to deliver us. When that transformation happens, we begin to relate to all of these in a true gospel-centered way. What might that look like for you in your life where you are as a parent, as a worker, as a grandparent, as a child? I share a story from grandson of Billy Graham. We talked a couple of weeks ago about a daughter of Billy Graham. It's just to highlight this, that people can be raised in deeply Christian environments where there's really kind of no excuse for things to go haywire, and they still do. They still do. So Billy Graham's grandson, a guy named Tullian, when he was a teenager, he got a PhD in hell raising, which is really bad. Got so bad that when he was 16, his parents kicked him out of the house. Shares that a small amount, what began as kind of a small amount, run-of-the-mill rebellion blossomed into a black hole of disrespect, self-centeredness that consumed his family. His parents tried everything, private school, counseling, interventions, but each of these new ways of what? Laying down the law, coming to him and saying, if you do this, you'll change. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Each of those ways of laying down the law didn't bring him to his senses. It failed. Because his parents were well-loved in the community, their friends tried to intervene. Like, we are not getting through to him. Please, won't you come and talk to him? So Tullian tells a story about two different lunches that he had. The first lunch, again, with a family friend, picked up, driven to Burger King. The man sits him down and right away says, look at all that God's given you. You're squandering it. You're making your parents' life a living hell. You go to a private school. You have this remarkable, godly heritage. Shape up. Snap out of it. Tullian writes, he was 100% right. He was 100% right. But what he said had no power to change me. Didn't change me at all. First, friends, the voice of the rules, right, that he needs to ship up shape out, (laughs) shape up or ship out the voice of the law, telling him exactly what he was doing, 100% right, but it had absolutely no power to change him. Second lunch, different friend. Tullian describes it this way. Once we were at the restaurant, he just looked at me, just looked at me and said, I know you're going through a tough time. I know life must seem very confusing now. Just want to tell you, I love you, and I'm here for you. I think God's going to do great things with you. Here's my phone number. Call me if you need me. If you want to tell me something you think you can't tell anybody else, call me and tell me. Then he changed the subject and started talking about sports. That, for Tullian, was a kind of an amazing grace conversation. It's the story of his conversion. He was loved, accepted by God. The Spirit hadn't yet made it real in his heart. We all have a friend or a family member who's acted out in this or a similar way. My record of speaking, kind of looking back over my whole life from teenage years till I was converted, it's not good, right? With people who've broken God's law, who aren't doing the right thing, most of my conversations have been like Tullian's first conversation. Kind of come in, read them the riot act. I feel a little bit better for having done it, but absolutely nothing changed. In fact, if anything, I only made things worse. Why is that? I mean, it should just be as simple as, son, sit down. Let me tell you what you're doing. You're really, you know, it should be that simple, but it isn't. I think I chose 
consistently chose the riot act over the gracious conversation because I forgot this. Even though I wasn't messing up at school or doing drugs or whatever, it didn't mean that I was any better than the person I was speaking to. Forgiven sinner like the person I'm speaking to. My desire to follow the rules probably blinded me just as much to God's grace. If then, is the gospel kind of, if you do this, then God will accept you. It isn't. It begins with this word, since you have been loved and accepted in Jesus Christ, then you get to do these many different things that give glory to God, that make your family, your friendships stronger and healthier. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Invite you to stand as you're able for our final hymn. Thank you.